Uh, do you want to share to the batch right now so that everyone can try solving it? Right. I send the link. Let's, let's send the link to the batch. Okay. Yeah. Now we're going to discuss the questions. Uh, so the first part is about the thoracic cage and cavity. And just for your information, I got all the questions directly from the PowerPoint given to you by your doctors. So you're looking at one or two questions that are maybe out of course, not from your PowerPoints, but the rest you guys should be able to. So starting with the first question, the thoracic cage is divided into how many compartments? I know this is a silly question, but these are some types of questions that you would be expecting in an exam. So the correct answer for this question is three. As you can see, this is actually the first slide from your PowerPoint. And what it says is that the thoracic cavity is divided into three parts, the, mediast the mediastinum and the two pleural cavities. And what's important for you guys to know is not, is not that it's only made out of three compartments, but also what is in each compartment. So as you guys know, your mediastinum, you should know what is inside the mediastinum, the heart, the great vessels, aorta, pulmonary, uh, arteries, veins, everything. You should know what is inside or the contents of the intestine. And then the second one is the pleural cavities. So we have two lungs, so two pleural cavities. It's a simple answer, but you should be able to get it right because these are some questions that they can trick you guys with in the exam. So that's regarding the first question. Now, this is a more difficult question and it was not in your PowerPoint, but you guys did take it in lab and I think it is important for you guys and I will explain why. So. The correct answer for this question is actually four. The answer, whoever got, uh, whoever put number four, that's the correct answer. So there's four parts of the mediastine. There's the middle mediastine, the anterior mediastine, posterior mediastine, and the superior mediastine. What's important for you guys to know is what passes through every part of the mediastine. I'm not sure if you guys did take this uh, during this first year, but I do recall from my first year that we had to know what passes through each part of the mediastine. I will not go through it uh, right now for the sake of time, but once we send you guys a PowerPoint and you see this question, make sure to do to, to go through it. Okay, so let me right. So they, these questions are actually very important. And what what they do in the exam is they won't get you the question as straightforward as this. Rather what they will do is instead of telling you where does the second rib articulate, they'll give you a scenario and they'll, they'll end the scenario by saying, okay, um, on the head of the, let's say here, at the, at the, at the head of the angle of uh, Louis, what do we find? And that's basically how they get it. And it's a very easy question to get right. So you need to memorize this photo and you should really know what, why each part is clinically important and what, what you should know here is where does the second rib articulate? It articulates here in uh, number three, near the angle of Louis. Where does the first rib articulate? The first rib articulates here at the lateral edge of the uh, manubrium, so here. And uh, the third question is where does the clavicle articulate? It articulates here, superior part of the manubrium, okay? And they will get you a question in the exam and they might ask you to put or match which one goes where. And um, in my previous exam for the 12th batch, we actually got a question similar like this and it, they, got, they repeated it three times. So uh, it's very important to know the landmarks of the bones and, what, and where, where, what's attached to each part. So they might get you an example in the exam with a scenario that says, uh, the, the surgeon was putting his hand on the patient's chest and he felt a bump. Uh, he, he discovered that this bump is the angle of Louis. Which rib is uh, attached to this, uh, to this angle of Louis? And you should be able to know that it is the second rib. They will not give it to you straightforward. They will give you a scenario and with your basic knowledge, you should be able to answer the scenario. I think uh, Muhammad's questions are more of uh, clinically oriented questions. Mine are a little bit more straightforward. That's why they might have been difficult. But you should know all of these landmarks and why they're each, each one is important. All right. So, so far, any questions, by the way?
Any questions? All right. So I hope the manubrium and the sternum is clear. Uh, all of these questions, I got them straight from your PowerPoint. Uh, so make sure to go through your PowerPoint again if you're, if you're not able to answer the uh, questions uh, correctly. Now, uh, this question is a little bit tough, but it's uh, important also. Name the borders of the superior thoracic inlet. So you need to know what is the superior thoracic inlet, what is the inferior thoracic inlet, and what the borders are for each one. So the superior thoracic inlet is the thing you see here on the right side of your screen. And it's basically um, serves as a passage for vital organs, vessels, nerves, and esophagus and trachea. It's called the superior thoracic uh, aperture or the superior thoracic inlet. They're two different names, but they mean the same thing. You should also know that the superior thoracic inlet is the same as the inferior uh, is not the same as the inferior thoracic inlet. The inferior thoracic inlet is at the bottom of uh, the body near the diaphragm. And you should know the borders for it too. It's present, it's uh, written in your uh, PowerPoint. So the answer for the question above is anteriorly, we see the head of the manubrium, which is the sternum basically, but you cannot say sternum. You have to specify that it is the head of the manubrium. Laterally, you see the uh, medial borders of the first rib and their costal cartilages, and posteriorly is the T1. So there are three borders for the superior inlet or the superior uh, thoracic inlet, and uh, it is uh, anterior, you have the manubrium, laterally, you have the medial borders of the first ribs and the crustal cartilages, and posteriorly, you have the T1. So these landmarks are very important, and they will help you answer questions in the exam, like this question. So what is the thoracic outlet syndrome? I'm pretty sure you guys heard it. And this will 100% be um, tested on in the exam. So the thoracic outlet syndrome is the compression of the neurovascular structure in the thoracic outlet. The thoracic outlet is the same as the thoracic inlet. It's, it's a big misconception. The thoracic outlet is just going upwards. The thoracic inlet is going out inwards, but it's the same opening. And um, there's a lot of confusion between uh, clinicians and surgeons, what is the actual thoracic outlet? But for the sake of your exam, the thoracic outlet is the same as the thoracic inlet. So we can actually call this as a thoracic inlet syndrome, but for the sake of medicine, um, we call it the thoracic outlet syndrome. And what happens is that the structures we talked about, like the esophagus, the trachea, the nerves, the muscles, in the thoracic outlet syndrome, they are compressed. And because they are compressed, uh, they will present with symptoms. So you might present with ischemia and muscle pain because you're blocking uh, vessels that supply the muscles. You might, uh, 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 you might uh, have paresthesia or you might have numbness in his hand because of the nerves being compressed. And uh, there are specific or four different types of ways we can have the thoracic outlet syndrome. It could be because of an extra cervical rib, which is very common in newborn children. Some people are just born with a cervical rib that can extends from their C5 all the way to the front, causing compression to the thoracic outlet. Or there could be a tumor, mostly known as a pancreas tumor. There could also be a fractures. Fractures can end up leading to thoracic outlet syndromes. And the fourth one, it is a hypertrophy of the scalene muscles. So the scalene muscles are the muscles we have here on the neck. And... Uh, from, from your MSK, you guys should know that uh, there are some nerves like the brachial plexus that pass through this from between the scalene muscles. And if we have hypertrophy of the scalene muscles, they will compress the uh, nerves. And what will, what, this will lead to the thoracic outlet syndrome. So that is what the thoracic outlet syndrome is. Thoracic, thoracic outlet syndrome is the compression of neurovascular structures in the thoracic outlet which will lead to symptoms such as pain, numbness, tingling, et cetera. Now, I, here I look for the definition. If you know the definition, then you will be able to answer this long question, right? So uh, a 31-year-old man comes to the physician because of a one-month history of pain in his right arm and numbness and tingling in his right hand. He recently started his job as a painter one month ago, had to quit his job because of the symptoms worsening whenever he tried to reach above his head. So up until this point, there's just extra information, and you will see this in the exam. You will see 
paragraphs and paragraphs, but you only need two or three keywords to answer the question. So all we know now is that he has pain in his right arm, tingling, numbness, and he cannot lift it above his head. That's all we care about. He has no history of serious illness and takes no medications. He does not smoke and drinks two beers daily. Vital signs are within normal limits. Physical examination showed decreased sensation and fine touch in the fourth and fifth fingers of his right hand. Radial pulse intensity decreases when the patient's right arm is abducted and externally rotated. All of this is just extra information. I don't really need to know what nerve innervates the, my thumbs, or I don't know. This is just general information. Which of the following is the most likely cause of this patient's symptoms? So, for, from from this from the patient's symptoms, we were and our knowledge of a thoracic outlet syndrome, we're expecting a patient with these types of symptoms to have some type of compression that's affecting both the neurovascular uh, the neurovascular uh, uh, culture and innervations of the hand. So we, we always, so we have differential diagnosis, but what is your top differential? It will obviously be the uh, either upper trunk compression or a cervical loop. But in our case, because these symptoms are more specific towards uh, a thoracic outlet syndrome, then he's most likely experiencing a, a, a cervical rib, an extra cervical rib, which is leading to these symptoms. So this is how you have to think of it. You always have to rule out, so is it carpal tunnel syndrome? Absolutely not, because carpal tunnel syndrome is in the wrist. Can the wrist uh, compromise the radial pulse and cause all of these symptoms? No. Uh, polymyositis. If you see something in the exam that you do not know, then most likely it's not important. This is in general. Cervical disc protrusion. Disc, uh, disc, disc protrusion does not cause uh, uh, compression in the radial pulse. It can cause neurovascular pain, yes, neuro, ne neurological pain, but it does not affect the uh, radial pulse. So now we're stuck with cervical lip or upper trunk compression. If we have upper trunk compression, we might only present with neurological symptoms. We will not present with radial pulse diminished. The only one that we know that is also present in thoracic outlet syndrome is the cervical lip. And that's why the answer here is the cervical lip. And even here, you can see that your doctor highlighted that the cervical lip and the pancreas tumor are the most common causes for uh, a thoracic outlet syndrome. So always look at the, uh, the things highlighted in red in the lecture. Most likely you will be tested on them. Okay, I'm going to speed up a little bit because I don't want to take more of your time. Uh, which part of the rib articulates with the transverse forces corresponding with the vertebra? Which one is the costal groove? And where do we see typical loops? All these questions are straightforward and scary, but they're all written in your lecture. As you can see, it's here nicely labeled, and she tells you where and which one and what's the function of each part of the, uh, uh, the typical rib. So here you can see that uh, the tubercle is the part where um, it binds to the, uh, so the tubercle articulates with the transverse process of the corresponding vertebra with the exceptions of ribs 11 and 12, because ribs 11 and 12 are atypical ribs, so they do not follow this system. Uh, the costal groove uh, fo uh, that follows inferior internal surface of the rib contains the intercostal vessels and nerves. And uh, Mohammed is going to be discussing with you guys why it's important to know the positioning of the vessels and nerves and why the costal group is very important for us. Uh, then they tell you what the function of the head is. The head is what articulates with the vertebral body and the IV discs and supra adjacent vertebral bodies. So you should know this, all of this information, you should know it because they could ask you which part of that rib articulates with this part. And you should know that the tubercle will articulate with this and the head will articulate with the vertebra and the costal groove controls the neurovascular culture. So all of these things are very important. Uh, there's also something, but I couldn't find a question on in the uh, online uh, or in any. But you should also know which is the most uh, most part in the ribs that uh, fracture or the most the weakest part of the rib. So just for your knowledge, the anterior part of the angle of the rib is the most uh, frequently uh, fractured part of the rib. And uh, you might be asking the exam. I think it was in the previous patch exam which is the most commonly uh, uh, fractured part of the rib is anterior to the ankle. And it's also present in your PowerPoint and she has put a photo for you guys. So make sure to go through it. Okay. So now we jump into a different topic.
which is the thoracic blood supply and uh, lymph drainage and uh, vein. Basically, here this question is talking about a patient who is experiencing a much greater upper extremity blood pressure and compared to his lower extremities. So this is a typical scenario of something called cortication of the aorta. Typical scenario. Yani if you read this in the exam, upper extremities have a high blood pressure and lower extremities have a lower blood pressure, don't think twice, it's cortication of the aorta. This is something you will see in clinics, you ask, be asked about it to the rest of your life. I'm a fourth year student, until this day, we get asked about it. So make sure to really engrave this in your head. And um, you should also know where the cortication happens. The cortication happens after the... Uh, uh, after the branching of the aorta. So you know the branching where the subclavian and all of these go out. So the cortication happens afterwards. If it happens before, then that's gonna be leading to different symptoms. But the most common or the typical is the cortication happening after. So make sure you keep this in mind. Um, is this point clear for everyone? Am I going too fast? Should I slow down? All right. The next question talk, is talking about the clinical character, the, the, the characteristic you find on an X-ray in case of cortication of the water. So what did we say? We said when there's a cortication of the water, there's an increased blood pressure in the upper extremities, which also, what's, what's included in the upper extremities? Our intercostal arteries, which are supply, supplied initially by the subclavian artery. So if all this blood, this high pressure is going back and it's going into our intercostal arteries, we said that the intercostal arteries are running along the ribs in the costal groove. So when there is high pulsating pressure on the ribs, what it will do is it will literally scratch the rib. And over time, it will create this typical clinical scenario called rib notching. And it is characteristic for uh, X-ray of uh, cortication of aorta. Uh, and this is after a long time, it's kind of chronic. If the, if, if the, the patient wasn't diagnosed earlier, then you will see this. Uh, now it really happens where we don't diagnose patient with cortication of aorta. But in case you see this photo in the exam and you will, you will see symptom, a photo like this, which is notching of the ribs. And this, this is characteristic for cortication of the aorta. I hope uh, this uh, concept is clear for you guys. Now, this question was a little bit unfair. I read it afterwards. Uh, but you guys did take what a herpes also infection is. This question, a little bit unfair. But something I want you guys to know is that the herpes zoster usually almost always affects the lateral cutaneous branches of the intercostal nerve dermatome. So in this case, you can see it's on the lateral side. So by common sense, I think we could tell that it will affect the lateral dermatome. But this question is unfair. But in general, you should know that herpes zoster virus, also known as chickenpox virus, will cause a sharp burning pain in the dermatome supplied by the nerve. It can affect any nerve in the, in the rib cage, but, it, but the, the nerve that will be affected, its dermatome will be uh, damaged. Now I have a question for you guys. Which uh, dermatome is uh, on the same level of the nipples? What is the dermatome? on the same level of the nipples. T, yes, yes, T4, good job, yes, T4. T4, 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 and it is always T4 for the nipples, and uh, it's, it's gonna help you orient yourself so you, you don't mix up between C and T and L. So T4 always at the nipples, and then you can go up for one, two, three, and then go down for five, six, seven, five, ten, eleven, twelve. okay? And uh, they could ask you a question that this part of the nipples was damaged or this part of the chest was damaged, which dermatome is affected? Always T4. T4. Okay. And make sure you know, you, you, you can spot this type of uh, infection when you look at the patient or if you get the photo in the exam. Yeah, it's pretty easy. Okay, next. So uh, thoracic blood supply is not an easy topic. I had to revise it actually. Uh, so. For the people who chose correct answer, <laughs> Allah is a But uh, 
uh, let's talk about the real answer now. For which blood for which blood vessels do intercostal arteries in the eighth intercostal space receive blood direct? Okay. So the answer for this question is in the PowerPoint. So first of all, let's read the PowerPoint and then we're gonna go back to the question. Okay. So always for the ribs, think of the blood supply as two parts, an anterior part and a posterior part, even for the venous regions. Think of it as an anterior part and a posterior part. For blood supply, the anterior part, you, you need to divide it that the first, for the anterior part, the first six have their own blood supply and the last six have their own blood supply. So the first six anterior are supplied by the internal thoracic artery, which is a branch from the subclavia. That's Take it easy again. Internal thoracic artery, which is a branch from the subclavia. It's written here, clearly. For the first six. But for the seventh, eighth, and nine, they're supplied by something called the musculophrenic artery. Okay? If you cannot say internal thoracic. Although the musculophrenic artery is a branch of the internal thoracic, but you cannot say. Because the musculophrenic artery what happens is after the internal thoracic artery goes down, it splits into two parts, the superior epigastric and the inferior uh, and the musculophrenic artery. The musculophrenic artery will run against the costal uh, cartilage of the ribs and the superior epigastric artery will go to the abdomen. So for the uh, musculophrenic artery, while it's going down to supply the diaphragm, it will give branches for the seventh, eighth and ninth uh, ribs. So in that question, what they were asking us is about the eighth intercostal space, okay? So the eighth intercostal space is supplied by the musculophrenic artery. But for the first six, anteriorly, we're supplied by the internal thoracic artery, a branch from the subclavian. I hope that concept is clear. For the posterior part, it's a little bit different. The first two intercostal spaces are supplied by something called the superior intercostal artery, which is also from the subclavian artery. So the, the first two only are supplied by the subclavian uh, artery. But the rest from third to 12th for the posterior part are all supplied by the thoracic aorta. They, they directly branch out from the thoracic aorta. And an easy way to remember this is that, always remember that the abdominal and the thoracic aorta are on the posterior, retroperitoneal, posterior part. So, it will just give branches on its way down to the posterior part from the third to the 12th. But for the first two parts, for the first two parts, they will be supplied by the subclavian. That's where the arterial supply, guys, please make sure you're clear and you're fluent with this. Um, you will be tested up on it in the exam. It might be confusing, so make sure you're clear. Uh, make sure to open one and watch YouTube videos, uh, visual videos, which are really helpful, honestly. Uh, does anyone have any questions regarding the arterial supply for the thoracic uh, thoracic gauge or thoracic arteries? You're welcome. Um, previous question for this one, it's the musculophrenic artery. All right. Next question. So, uh, to which posterior blood vessels do intercostal veins in the ninth intercostal space drain directly? Again, like I said, there's an anterior part and a posterior part, even for the venous drainage. But for the venous drainage, it's much easier. I will not go into the specifics. I will just go to what your doctor gave you. For the anterior part, they drain into either the internal thoracic or the muscular. So if you get a question and they tell you anterior venous drainage, if you see internal thoracic, put it. If you see musculophrenic, put it, okay? But for the posterior part, it goes into azygous and hemiazygous veins, okay? That easy. Posterior, azygous or hemiazygous, anterior, internal thoracic or musculophrenic. And you always need to remember for the thoracic cage, the anterior and posterior are very important. You need to be very oriented regarding arteries and venous drainage. For these two things, you always, when you think of venous drainage and artery, think of anterior and posterior. Okay, I'm gonna speed it up again. Uh, I hope everything was clear with that point. Now, this question you guys should all answer me uh, after the explanation I gave you. 
with which arteries is the internal thoracic artery directly connected? Yellow. I want everyone to answer on the uh, chat as soon as quick as you can. The internal thoracic artery. Okay. Internal thoracic artery. Okay. Guys, don't be scared. Answer. Whatever you know, just say it. La, la, don't put all the options, but put one. <laughs> Yes, the correct answer is subclavian. The internal thoracic artery branches out from the subclavian artery. So the subclavian artery will, the internal thoracic artery will come out of the, uh, from the subclavian artery and go down to supply the thoracic uh, cage. And while it's going down, when it gets to the sixth rib, it will split into the muscular phrenic and the superior epigastric. And then the, the muscular phrenic will give supplies for the seven, eight, and nine. Okay, I hope that's clear, guys. Um, let's go to the next. Uh... Uh, quick question. Yes. The, uh, the, the, this last question asked for arteries, so more than one. Uh, does that mean the first two and the subclavian are all right? No, 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 just, just subclavian artery. Um, so Directly you know connected that... to. What they meant by this question, maybe the question is a little bit worded incorrectly. They should have said origin of the question. Oh, yeah. The origin of the question is uh, of the internal thoracic receptive. And yeah, okay, fair enough. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Right, thank you for that, Jenna. Uh, so, coronary arteries blood supply. So, this will be the bulk of your exam, guys. And I really, really recommend being good with this topic. You cannot make a mistake at all and even Hamad's question will test your knowledge regarding these questions so make sure you focus on my part because it will help you answer the rest of the questions so this is a photo of the blood supply of the heart i got from the usmle it is more than enough to answer all your questions okay i don't want to go through it i'll see oh okay never mind i have to go through because i need the questions right uh, i'll go to the google doc one second Google Chrome. All right. So we start here regarding the questions. The blank branches into the circumflex artery and the left anterior descending artery. I think this one's straightforward. What do you guys think the answer was? Okay, okay, good. All right, so this is a common question. You guys need to be able to link this to any clinical question that might come, okay? They will not give it to you straightforward like this. Okay, the right coronary artery, correct, by the way, for the people who answered A, that's the correct answer. The right coronary artery divides from the posterior interverticular artery and the something artery to form the posterior interverticular artery and something blank. Artery. What do you guys think the answer was? Correct. The right marginal artery. Yes. Good. The answer here is the right the, the marginal artery, which is we usually refer to it as the right marginal artery. Correct. Good. Blood flowing into the cardiac veins enters the. So where does all the blood supply from our body go into? They all go into the left atrium. So everyone should have put left atrium. No, they, they first go into the sinus, then, then they go into the left atrium. You have to keep that. Uh, so so the drain into the sinus and then from the sinus to the left atrium. Okay. So what is meant by right coronary artery dominance? So this is very important because uh, I don't think everyone is clear with this concept, but the steps is gonna make it much nicer for you. Look how simple it's written. So the right dominant circulation is when the posterior descending artery comes from the right coronary artery. But left dominant is when the posterior descending artery is coming from the left circumference. And co-dominance is when the posterior descending artery comes from both the right and the left. 
as simple as that. Literally as simple as that. Hala, which one is better? I mean, not better. Which one is more common? The right dominant circulation. 60% or 70% of the world population have right dominant artery. And alhamdulillah, it's that way and not left dominant. Because the problem with the left dominant artery is that the most common artery that gets occluded is the left uh, anterior descending artery and the left, uh, left coronary artery. And if these vessels get occluded, then not only will we have an anterior ischemia, we'll have an anterior and posterior left ventricular ischemia. We'll have complete ischemia of the heart. And, the, resus and the, the, the prognosis or the survival of the patient is much more difficult because there's only one blood supply from the back. And the most common artery that gets occluded is the left uh, anterior descending artery or the left side of the heart. So that's why it's, it's, it's thankfully, most of the, the population is right dominant circulation because if the left artery is occluded, the posterior part of the heart will not be dam will not be affected because the right coronary circulation is still going. So this is a nice way to keep thinking of it. Yeah, I know, alhamdulillah, in the ashab al yamin in the right dominant circulation is seventy percent of the population, and it's better because if there is a left uh, artery occlusion, then they will still have a blood supply for the posterior part. And make sure you know this concept really well. Make sure to read this thoroughly. It uh, goes through each one specifically. You'll be tested on it right now by Muhammad. Uh, I hope everything is clear, guys. I hope I didn't take too much of your time. I know I talked a lot, but uh, it's harder when uh, you're, you're, it's not interactive, you know? Um, I have a question. Uh, yes, guys, I meant right atrium. It was uh, by accident. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So I, I saw everyone text me privately, right, Adrian? <laughs> okay, yeah, I meant right, Adrian. My, my fault. Okay, I hope I hope it's clear, guys. Uh, I focused on the main points. Everything I said is in your lectures. They will not get you a question from outside your lectures. So please, your uh, reference and your main source is your lectures. Um, do not go too far uh, to the point where you open the step book to study uh, the topics. The maximum you guys can go is uh, opening grays, uh, the grays or the question bank, the grays question bank, and solving that. But I, I wouldn't recommend going past that. I highly recommend doing all previous batch questions. Go all through all of them. There's a lot of repeated questions. And do not tell your doctors that there is a previous batch question. And if you do get a previous batch question and you get it wrong, do not go to the doctor and ask him about it, okay? I think uh, that's a rule of thumb, guys. Uh, best of luck to all of you. Uh, I hope I didn't take much of your time. Muhammad is going to take over. Um, if, if you have any other questions, uh, please, you can always contact me. If you see me in uni, you can always ask. And if you guys need advice, uh, let me know. Uh, good luck, everyone. Uh, good luck with Muhammad. His questions are harder than mine. Thank Bye -bye. you. Myself. Okay. So now we move on to the, do you guys want to break or are you good? Uh, five minutes, please. Okay. We'll come back at 8.05. Okay. Okay, so I'll first start with the pericardium and the external features of the heart. The first question, a 42 year old woman is admitted to the hospital after blunt trauma to her sternum by the steering wheel during a car crash, your geographic examination reveals a cardiac tamponade. ECG data indicates that the heart has been severely injured. Which of the following cardiac structures will most likely be injured? Write the answer in the chat. Yes, it's B, the right ventricle. This concept, this question is asking about the concept of the surfaces of the heart. So anteriorly, you have the uh, right ventricle. On the right, you have the right atrium. On the left, you have the left auricle. And posteriorly, you have the uh, left ventricle, I think. Yes. Okay, next question. A 39-year-old male is admitted to the hospital with a complaint of severe retrosternal pain. That radiates to the left shoulder. The pain is relieved by leaning forward. Auscultation reveals a pericardial friction drop, leading to a diagnosis of pericarditis. Which of the following nerves is responsible for the radiating pain? 
כן, ראיתי אנטי. Uh, this question is basically asking for the nerve supply of the uh, pericardium. So the nerve supply or the parietal pericardium is, or the fibrous pericardium, which is what feels pain, is the uh, phrenic nerve and the visceral, so what's on the surface of the heart is by the vagus nerve and the sympathetic trunk. Next question. If you have any questions, stop me directly, please. A 54-year-old male is admit, admitted to the hospital with dyspnea, imaging and physical examination and ECG. The, the studies revealed uh, severe mitral valve prolapse. Auscultation of this, uh, this valve is performed at which location? Again, answer. Yes. Okay. Why is it not D? What does the test for? So you have to go pulmonary. Okay. The right side is for the aortic, the left side is for the pulmonary. Think of it, no. There's only one thing on the right. So memorize it. And on the right side is the aorta. R, R. And the rest is on the left. Okay. Next question. A 35-year-old male bartender is admitted to the hospital due to severe dysphagia. A CT scan revealed carcinoma of the middle segment of the esophagus. Which of the following structures will, will most likely be affected in the if the carcinoma increases in size? I see B and A. This is the same concept as the first question. Yes, it's the left atrium. Basically, because the esophagus is behind, right behind the, the heart, and the uh, right the, the left atrium is right in front of it. So, if there's a carcinoma in the esophagus, and if it expands, so it could be pushing on the left atrium. As you can see here, so it's yeah, it's that feature. Do you have any questions for the external features of the heart, even if I didn't ask the question about it? Or is it all clear? Oh, good. Okay. Moving on to the diaphragm and intercostal space. By the way, all the questions for the uh, for the previous lecture was for was from uh, Gray's Anatomy. This question is a mix. This lecture is a mix between Gray's Anatomy and BRS. Okay, this first question: A twenty-five-year-old female is admitted to the hospital after a violent automobile crash. A radiographic examination revealed four broken ribs in the left thoracic wall, producing a flared chest. Observable on physical examination. Which of the following conditions is most likely to be to be observed during physical examination? A. Yes, that's it. What is this called? What's this type of what's this type of motion called? It has a name. It's in the, it was on the slide. Paradoxical. Yes. Paradoxical inspiration. Next question, uh, a 57 year old male. Uh, oh, by the way, the previous question, this previous question was in BRS and it came in a past exam. I think it was 10th batch, I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, a 57 year old male is admitted to the emergency department after he was struck by a truck while crossing a busy street. Radiographic examination revealed flare chest. During physical examination, the patient complains of severe pain during inspiration and expiration. 
which of the following nerves is most likely responsible for sensing a pain? So I got one D on A. Any more answers? Yes, it's D. Uh, I get why you think it is diaphragm, but they said flail chest here. So there's a problem with the intercostal. And the blood, the nerve supply of the intercostal is the uh, intercostal nerve. If there was a problem with the diaphragm, like one of them is rising, one of them is not, then that's a problem with the phrenic. But it's, or if there's pericarditis, then it's phrenic. But because they said there's flared chest, so there's a fracture to the uh, the ribs, and there's uh, like there's a problem during inhalation and, and expiration, then it's the uh, the intercostal nerve. All good. Next question, a 32-year-old patient has tension pneumothorax that can be treated with neural aspiration. To avoid an injury of the intercostal neuromuscular bundle, the needle may be inserted in which of the following mechanisms. This wasn't in your slides, but I'm pretty sure it's important and I was taught last year this. I don't know if you were taught in the lab or anywhere else. Yes, it's A. The reason why it's A is because uh, this is your ribs, okay? And right behind your ribs, there's a groove, as you can see. Wait, let me do a pointer. Uh, pointer options, laser pointer. As you can see, there's a groove here. And in this groove, you have a neurovascular bond, the van, vein arterial nerve. So if, uh, if you do any of the other three, for example, deep to the upper border, so you're going down here, deep to the upper border, then there's a high chance you're going to hit a nerve or anything from the neurovascular bone because they're behind it. And if you go beneath it, then you're going to go right into the nerve. But if you go right above the upper border with an upward angle, then you're most probably going to miss all the nerves and you'll be safe. All good? Okay. Next question. Uh, a 43-year-old female pa patient was lying down on, on the hospital bed for more than four months. Her normal quiet expiration is achieved by contraction of which of the following structures? Why not D? Diaphragm does expiration as well. Uh, not really. For for questions like these, like big questions, what I usually do, I never ever ever read the whole thing. I'm just reading it because it's like because you can just for you guys. What I usually do, it might like my way might not work for everyone, but I usually go to the last question, the last sentence, and while I'm going down, I just skim through the 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 the, the, the whole paragraph to see if there's keyword, and the whole, the keyword for this question is quiet. As you can see here be the slides, it says quiet breathing is by expiration of passive elastic recoil. There's a lot of questions like this where you can see a whole paragraph. Even you see it's more next year in POD and this stuff. You'll see a whole paragraph with like, useless information, but you just see one tiny word. Like for example, there's a, there's a bacteria. I just see survives in heat. One, and I'll know the answer. Because like it's, there's a lot, but the ones we took, there's only one. So like you you look you just look through the whole paragraph can for any key points you save yourself like three four five minutes and then when you're revising you can read the whole thing to make sure you didn't miss anything out. But that's what I do. Okay, moving on to the last lecture, the internal features of the heart. Uh, which uh, which heart valve has the least described anterior left and right? This was a previous question.
Yes. You can see here, there are two things you can use to differentiate between them. Yes, aortic has the, you can see here in the top right, the pulmonary has anterior right, left, and the aortic has the front and the right, and left and right and posterior. There's another thing you can do to differentiate between them. If they go to your picture like this, what is it? Anyone knows? Because there are two things you can do to differentiate. One of them is the anterior, yes, the aortic sinuses, which open for the coronary artery. All clear? Okay. Next question. Uh, a three a three year old male patient presents with a clinically significant atrial septal defect. The ASD usually results from incomplete closure of which of the following structures. Yes. Here. The crystal terminalis is found where? In which chamber? Yes, again, correct. All of these are previous past, past questions. So you see, I got you the, the difficult case scenario is because like that way you can test yourself and like test the way you study it so you can connect points. But they're usually easy questions and like in CVP right now for anatomy. I don't know about physiology. Physiology is horrible. Um, I have a question here. The yes. rough part of the right atrium. Yes. Um, how would we describe its location? It's on the would we say side. like okay, so would we say um the right wall of the right atrium anteriorly, or does that not make sense? Uh, it, sure, yes, it is the right wall of the right atrium. It's a it's a right anterior, like right in the anterior wall. Mm -hmm. No, okay. I, don't, I don't think we're going to ask something like this, but yeah, you're right. It's like the right each anterior wall of the right each year. Okay, thank you. Okay, a 57-year-old patient has a heart murmur resulting from the inability to maintain constant tension on the cusps of the EV valve. Which of the following structure is most likely damaged? And that's it. Any questions? Uh, yeah, I have another question. Yes. 